Hello, everybody, and welcome to another episode of Blood on the Razor Wire TV, where we bring it to you real and we bring it to you raw. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, and definitely share the video. Got a special guest today, but I'm going to let him introduce himself and tell you who he is, where he's from, and a little bit about his situation. Tell the people who you are, man. Hey, everybody. My name is John Perrette. I'm currently incarcerated in a federal halfway house in Hattiesburg, Mississippi. I was just released from federal prison after serving nine years, four months, and five days on engaging in the business of selling firearms without a license, conspiracy to commit federal firearms violations, and possession of a destructive device. I started my incarceration off at Oakdale Low. I uh, had some trouble there. Went to Forest City Medium, did, did some time there. Uh, Worked the program. I went to, I went to uh, the low. I stayed out of trouble. Uh, took some VT classes uh, and just did the right thing. Went all the way down, all the way to the camp. And uh, and, and, and now here I am. But we're going to talk about a couple things, right? So okay. you got a firearms case. How old were you? Um, I was 24 when I was indicted. I was 22 when the – it was a two-year investigation, so I was 22 at the moment of the offense. Let me ask you this. How much money did you make? Uh, $1,200 maybe. <laughs> so for $1,200, you ended up with what? Doing nine years? Yeah, yeah, exactly. A little bit over. That's like a penny on the day, if that. Yeah, it's, it's absolutely yeah I, actually, I actually have 14 co-defendants. And, uh, you know, the, 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 the things that we were doing, I mean, none of the guns that I sold were actually illegal i mean that i had bought most of them from the pawn shop myself they were in my name uh -huh. um so it was shocking to me when the feds kicked in the door i mean don't get me wrong i was no angel you know i had other things going on but when the feds kicked in the door and you know i had been waiting for that call for a while and then when they when they got me in the in the truck and they gave me the indictment i'm looking at the indictment I'm, and it says guns i'm thinking guns what are you what, what are y'all talking about guns and yeah they had me on a 30 count indictment on, under firearms and uh, it was really shocking, man, because, like I said, uh, there there wasn't necessarily an intent to commit a crime uh, in, in, in the selling of the firearms. So you go to prison, you end up going, where'd you go, Oakdale? Yeah, Oakdale Low was my first spot. What were you thinking when you were on your way to prison? Were you a little bit nervous? Were you a little bit worried? Had you ever been to prison before? Oh, uh, no, I was. A, it was a, my first time, man. I was a first-time offender, and... Um, you know, I didn't understand low, medium, pin, camp, like that, that, that stuff didn't mean anything to me. Right. So when the, when, when, you know, when the bus pulls in, all I see is razor wire and dudes all tatted up on the rec yard working out. And I'm thinking we're going to bang, we're going to bang this whole nine years. And I, I didn't know that's why I got in a fight so fast because the moment that somebody said something that I didn't like, I said, Hey, let, let's, let, let's handle this. Let's fight because I didn't understand the system. You know, I mean, years later, I ended up going back to a low and, and learn to let a lot of shit slide, but but in those initial in that initial few days there, man, yeah, man, I was I was terrified. I didn't I didn't understand that being good, and you know having my, having my paperwork and being able to walk a yard meant anything. You know what I mean? I didn't. I thought I'd be fighting until the day I got out. Honestly, what was your upbringing like? What? How did you get involved in in a firearms investigation? Like, where, where did that come uh, from? Well, it's, it's interesting. I'm from Southern Mississippi. I'm from the country. Um, firearms is a way of life where I'm from. I learned how to shoot a gun right after I learned how to walk. Um, you know, when I, when I was growing up, uh, uh, some of the milestones in life was, was firearms. You know, you got your BB gun and then when you're old enough, maybe dad to get you a 22. And then when dad sees you're responsible at 22, move up to a, a 410 and so on and so on and so forth. And, you know, in, in, in our, in our, in our, in my culture, you know, I wanted to, I wanted to inherit my grandfather's firearms, you know, the Brownie automatic, the Lee Enfield 303, the ones that were in the, in the big, nice polished display cases. So um, I started, I started buying and selling firearms as a hobby. Um, I, I really, really like firearms. I think it's a, it's a good way to release stress. I go out and shoot firearms. I train my girl how to use firearms. That way, when I'm, when I'm away from the home, she understands how to use them safely. Um, so I, it was a way of life for me. So I buy, I buy them and I shoot them. And then when I, when I'm done with them and I want to replace them and I want to buy more, I, I sell those guns and then I go buy some more. So, um, I actually was having a housewarming party for, I was, I had, I got an apartment in Biloxi and, um, this, a girlfriend of mine came over who's actually still incarcerated, cherished Denise Sherrill. She's in, um, she's in Tallahassee low right now. That's your um, co-defendant. Yeah. Yeah. It's my co-defendant. Oh, I know exactly who she is. Yeah, um, she's actually incarcerated now. She came to my housewarming party and she was like, hey, uh, we were having some wine, having some steaks. And she was like, hey, uh, 
do you have any guns you want to sell? And I was like, you know, not really. Uh, you know, I, everything I have right now is for personal, right? Well, as the night went on and we, you know, we had a few more, a little bit more wine in us, she asked me again. I said, well, look, I mean, you know, what is it? You got to, you got a guy that's going to, you know, buy them. Cause a lot of times people want to, when they want to buy firearms, they, they, they don't want to really spend the money for them. I firearms did her, aren't cheap. Hey, I did her clemency petition, man. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. She's a, she's a really good person, man. She's my sister. I love her to death. We have an extremely uh, tight relationship. And despite all the hardship that we went through, we're still tight. We still talk all the time. Uh, we have a really good relationship. Um, and, and, and the feds weren't able to, to drive a wedge between us. We had been friends for years and years and years before this, and we'll always be friends. Uh, so they weren't able to drive a wedge between us. But she was actually messing, she was actually selling firearms to an undercover ATF agent named Jason. And, uh, you know, she assured me he was cool. Everything was good. So I was like, you know what? I gave her a, uh, I gave her a firearm and said, Hey, you know, I'm only going to talk about this because it's over with. Right. Um, I I wouldn't normally be willing to to discuss these things, especially being recorded, but our our case is final. Right. But I gave her a firearm and then she went and sold it. When she bought me the money back, it was a pretty decent amount of money. And I said, Oh, okay, well this guy must, you know, he must understand and appreciate firearms in a way that's going to, you know, where, where he's going to be willing to pay for them. So, um, she, I, she gave me his number or she gave me his number or, uh, he gave, she gave him my number. I really can't remember how it worked out, but I ended up getting in contact with this ATF agent, this undercover agent. He came to my house and he bought, uh, two or three firearms rifles that I had. And then, um, you know, he came one or two more times over a two year period. And then on May 30th, 2012 at five o'clock in the morning, uh, my door was blown off the hinges by some, some kind of little dynamite or something. They shot me with a, uh, with a, with a, with a, with a, uh, flash bang and zip tied me and took me out you know they shot you with a flat they shot you with a flashbang hit you with it yeah i was actually running toward the back door right and whenever they whenever they entered the house you know look i i actually was awake right i heard a door close and it's not you know i have friends that sometimes they drink too much and they and they can't make it all the way home so they'll stop by my house and crash so it's not out of the ordinary for somebody to stop by at 5 a.m but i wasn't expecting anybody so I, I, I was actually, I had some real bad indigestion. So I actually was getting up to drink some, drink some cold milk. Yeah. And uh, I, I, I heard the door shut. And when I, when I looked out the thing, there was a white panel van pulled all the way up to the front of the, the, the door. And I see these guys, they're in skeleton ski mask. They're not like badges out, you know, they're in like coming in to, to, to rob and kill and, and, and look for money type shit. You know what I mean? So I didn't even know that they were the police. So I took off running for the back for the backyard, and uh, they they blew the door open with something. I don't know what they used, but it was like an explosive. It wasn't like a pop 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 battering ram. It was like a, a some type of I don't know what they used. But when they came in, they, I guess they saw me heading for the back. And they shot the flashbang, and when when the flashbang went off, of course I lost the trajectory where I was going. I was heading towards the back door, but I got I got so disoriented I actually ended up running into the wall. Before I knew it, I was flex cuffed and on my way to. The federal courthouse that, in Southern Mississippi. That was the ATF. That was the U.S. Marshal Services uh, and the ATF um, with some Harrison County uh, uh, backup out there. You know, they, yeah. they 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 had they had all the boys out there. They had the whole squad. You know. I'm going to ask you a couple other things. So you end up sure. leaving Oakdale. What happened? You got in a fight in Oakdale, right? Yeah, I got in a fight with a, with a, a buddy of mine's dad. Right. Um, <laughs> The, dude, the dude's kind of senile. He's kind of weird. He, he says a lot of weird shit. And he says something about my brother that wasn't true, that my brother put the ATF on him. The truth is, is that no one knew that that dude was an ATF agent, right? Yeah. If 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 Cherish knew that that dude was an ATF agent, she wouldn't be sitting in prison still while I'm free, right? Yeah. Okay. If I, know, if I knew that he was an ATF agent, David Marshall Waters, the dude I got in a fight with, wouldn't be at home for the last, like, five years while I'm still sitting in here. I would have gotten a 5K1. You know, I would have, I would have gotten substantial assistance. I wouldn't have, I wouldn't be like literally the last one. I think there's two of us remaining in. I, I'm, I was like the third to last. That's, that's actually out. So, um, the, the dude said this about my brother, and uh, it got back to me, and people started asking me like, "Hey, man, is your brother a rat?" And I'm like, "My brother a rat? Fuck no, my brother ain't no fucking rat." Can I cuss on here? Yeah, you're all right. It's a prison show, man. Okay, I don't want to. I don't. I, mean, wanna, I don't know. Hey, listen, you I don't know, know we, who we get. We get a lot of kids that watch it, but. Okay. All right. Well, I'm going to, I'm going to refrain then. I'm going to refrain. I apologize. Uh, I, I, you're I didn't all know right. what your target audience was. Do your thing, bro. Uh, but, uh, 
so yeah, man, uh, I caught him on the rec yard. He was over there like playing a little, some little harmonica or something. And I just went to him and I said, Hey, homie, check it out, man. Uh, look, this, this yard ain't going to be big enough for the both of us because you, you got a slick ass mouth and you just make anything up and you'll just say anything. So, uh, you need to either check in or come to this bathroom right here and take this like a man. And I just shot off for the bathroom and I, I figured he was going to check in. Honestly, uh, I never thought he was going to come into the bathroom, but he did. And I, and I respect him for that. He came in the bathroom. He took his ass whooping like a man. And, um, we, uh, we both went to the shoe. Uh, this dude went to the yard and he, and, and he said, Hey man, there's a dude that wants to talk to you on the yard. So I actually went out there and of course we're in the cages on the yard, you know? So I, it's not like we're like in the cage together, but he's, you know, a cage away from me. And he's like, Hey, I'm sorry, man. You know, I screwed up. I shouldn't have said anything about your brother. I knew it wasn't true, man. You know, what do you want to do? Do you want to, do you want to admit to it or, uh, you know, how do you want to do it? I said, yeah, man, look, let, 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 let's admit we had a disagreement and let's say that, Hey, we're cool. Come move in the cell with me for a little while. And then, and, and they'll let us out. And that never happened. Uh, you know, we, 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 we copped to it. We said we'd move in. SIS said, Hey, we really don't do that anymore. That was something that we used to do. We used to put people in the cell together. And if they made it, we let them back out. We don't do that anymore. Or they don't do that. They didn't do that at that institution. Yeah. So he ended up going to Beaumont medium. I ended up going to Forest city medium. Did you feel bad about beating up your friend's dad? Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm no, not, not you, man, for real. no, 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 I really didn't because I really had wanted to do it in the county jail, but I was on pretrial and I didn't yeah. want to go into my sentencing, my three, five, five, three, a, you know, I didn't want that to be a, 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 a sentencing factor that I had beat this dude up. I mean, the dude had a slick ass mouth on him from the beginning and, and really just was real reckless, man. Like we're in, we're in the thing and he's showing pe people that's coming in, he's showing them our indictment and everything and talking to people. And the cops are coming to me and saying, Hey, this Russian guy we just bought in, he's comes from New York. He's a known rat. He comes in here and this is what he does. He comes in and he gets information on cases and then he gives it to the FBI or he gives it to the, whatever, you know, jurisdiction is looking for him. And this guy's over here talking about our indictment and about the stuff in it. I'm like, Hey man, you need to shut up, you know? But so you know, it is what it is. So now you you go to prison. You're in prison. See any crazy shit in there? Um. Yeah. You know, uh, prison's a crazy place, man. Like to to me, waking up every day is crazy. Like seeing seeing dudes standing in line every day to go to chow. You know, is it, crazy. That that's crazy to me. Just the whole the whole thing is crazy. I mean, there's no words in the human language to describe prison. Um. But you know, a couple things that I guess stand out to me was. I, I seen a dude get beat up in the TV room, right? And he got beat up fair and square, all right? It, it was over some money on a, on, a, on a ticket, on a gambling ticket. And uh, he, he, couldn't, he couldn't just live with the fact he got beat up. So what he did is he went to his cell, he put a lock in a sock, and as the cop was unlocking the doors, you know, on the bottom tier, he's like walking behind the cop with the lock, and he's waiting for it to get to – this guy, Marvin Jean Lewis, who was the one of the founding members of the Zopound gang in Miami, um, he was actually waiting for that door to open so that way he could get at Zo. So that way he, we called him Junk. That was his that was his nickname, Junk. He wanted to get it junk with the lock. Well, guess what? Junk had already done a bunch of time and already knew what it was. So he was already booted up with his shorts on, with his shirt off. So the moment the door popped, he came out, ducked the lock, hit the dude, got him down, took the lock from him, and through the lock and just started, just started, you know, wailing on him, beating him up pretty good. So he got the better, he got the better half of it. You know what I mean? Yeah. I mean, you were in a low and an FCI. You ever seen anybody get killed over there? I, I seen a dude get killed in Forest City Medium uh, in December of fifteen, I think it was. Um, the, the, he was a little guy, right? He was a little old man, and he was completely harmless. He was actually there for uh, bombs, for setting bombs. He tried to do a hit, right? Yeah. So he sent this bomb under the car, but he doesn't know that the FBI is watching him. You know, he's being tailed by the FBI. And then he goes and slides a bomb under this car. So he got like 40 years, right? He's never going to get out. But little old man said to himself, his celly didn't like him. All right. Uh, his celly's name was Seamus. Uh, something Seamus, right? He was a redheaded guy. I think he was from Arkansas. He actually came from a pretty affluent family. Yeah. He, he didn't like him. He didn't like the guy. Was he an and Irish so, dude? Seamus? Yeah, he was an Irish guy. He was like red, red beard. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I can't remember his first name, but his last name was Seamus. And uh, so he just didn't like his settler. He didn't like the old man. And this dude owed him a hundred dollars on his store. He ran like a little store. Yeah. And uh, he told the guy, "Hey, man, you want to get rid of that hundred dollar store debt?" And he was like, "Yeah." And he was like, "Well, get rid of my settler." 
So he, the, the, the dude found the guy at pill line at night, stomped him to death, killed him on the pill line. And, uh, they all got murder, murder for hire, murder, you know, murder, conspiracy to commit murder. Hey, I know who Seamus is, man. I was in Raybrook with him. I, Hey, he was an all right dude. He used to draw cards. He was an Irish dude. Yeah. He used to shovel snow. Always yeah, working. Yeah, yeah wow. that's him. That's him. I'm yeah. shocked, bro, that that, that that happened with that dude. I'm going to have to yeah. look that up. I'm shocked. Yep. 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 How much time so, did they end up with? Did they end up getting, you said they got charged with murder? Yeah, you know what? I was actually leaving there at that time. So it takes it takes a long time for those things to, 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 to go through the judicial process. So it, I was already gone. Yeah. by the time that it went through the process. And, and I never heard anything about it again. But if you want to look it up, you probably have to look for a city medium. That was that that was the area. That, that was where we were at when it happened. I can't believe it. Seamus had to be close to getting out. He was. He was, like a couple of years. Yeah, wow. he was. I know yeah, exactly they, who he is, man. Yeah, they said he was, like, from an affluent family that, that had, like, uh, some kind of business, some big business, maybe trucking or oil or something like I that. I know exactly. I know exactly who Seamus is, man. It's crazy. So, damn, man. It's hey, you know, people that are watching this, they need to know that, man. Some dudes go to prison and they got a little bit of time, you know, even 8 9 years in some perspectives it is a little bit of time. To some people like me, I had 40 years, but some of these dudes end up, man, with a life sentence. Yeah, I can actually give you another example. This guy JJ Hinkle in Texarkana, Texas, right? This kid was like 4 months to the door. And I was leaving to go to Estelle camp and he was a good kid working HVAC. He was young, real young guy. He'd only got like a 30 month sentence. You know, he was on like his cousin's conspiracy. So, you know, I, I pulled him up and I said, Hey, you know, I just want to let you know, man, it's a pleasure meeting you. You're a bright young man. You got a future ahead of you. Don't come back to this place. You're very talented with HVAC. You know, you're going to do good things. I leave. And then I find out that he's in the shoe for murder. He's in the shoe for murder. You know why? Because he was an HVAC guy, right? So he goes and fixes the ice machine, and he puts a sign on it that says, don't get any ice. Well, this this this, this Mo comes over there and says, grabs the ice and starts putting the ice in the thing, and JJ says, hey, man, what are you doing? You know, uh, you can't you read the sign? And the guy was like, you know, eh, screw you. And so JJ, JJ hit him one time, and he went down and it killed him instantly. One hit. One hit killed him instantly. Yep, and JJ, I don't know how much time he got, but it's it's all in it's all in the uh, in one of the papers. All you gotta do is Google Texarkana uh, and Hinkle, and and his case will pop up. He was indicted for I think for manslaughter. Absolutely crazy, man. Yeah, and you spend a lot of your time in the law library, right? Yeah, you know what's crazy is uh, you might actually know one of the guys that that mentored me, uh, Gregory Rook, uh, aka Trish. I don't know. Um, well, he was in Pollock for years. He's actually a legend in Pollock. Uh, he's a legend, and in a lot of the, in a lot of the, in a lot of the USPs because he's got so much time off. Yeah. I mean, he's got multiple lights off and just hundreds and hundreds of years of post conviction relief. And I actually started off as a typist because I, I can I can type really well. And then we had the Alpha Smarts, so we weren't using the like the old typewriters that you know we were using the Alpha Smarts. And I was typing, and and, and Trish saw me you know, really getting it and said, Hey, would you, would you like a job? And I said, yeah, sure. And I just started typing. And then I had, to, of course I started doing, now I'm doing legal research for Trish on top of the typing. And then it just all, you know, started kind of making sense to me. And then I ended up, you know, fighting my own cases. Some people say, uh, writing 2255s are easy, man. Are they? Uh, no, no, they're not easy at all. And I'm going to tell you what, a lot of guys will not approach me. Um, because a, I, I turn away probably 99 out of hundred cases. Well, maybe not that bad, but a lot. Okay. I, I don't, I don't do it for the money. Let, let, let that be clear. I don't do it for the money. And in fact, in border versus United States, I won that case in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in South Dakota, I won that case in the South Dakota. And I'm going to tell you what, when I, I got, when I got his team paperwork, right, it says his six month commissary deposit and he had under $10 put on his books in six months. So, you know what I told him? He was a, he was a native guy. He ran for natives. I said, Hey man, look, I'm going to do your 2255 because I know I'm going to win it. Okay. All I want you to do is I want you to give me those sunglasses on top of your head. And I want you to go get me a, 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 a jar of Folgers from your homeboys. And I'm going to do it. And I paid all of the administrative fees, all the copying and typing. I paid it all out of my own pocket. And I won that case and got his sentence reduced from 120 months to 77 months. So, um, it's not, it's, 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 it's not easy. 
Um, and in fact, most 2255s are completely frivolous. Um, th there's a very narrow scope of what's, uh, you know, what, what you can fight on 2255. A lot of guys want to go back and litigate their trial and, and, and what happened, and you just can't do it. It's a very narrow scope. Um, so it, 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 whenever they get it, they assume that you don't really have anything coming, you know? Yeah, kind of like one of those, like, death penalty cases and stuff, you know? You know, like you said, I win a lot, right? And I do win a lot of 2255s. I'm going to tell you why. Because I pick and choose, too. Because I know when I look at it, like, if I don't have a shot at winning it, I'm, I'm yep. trying, I'm not really doing it. So yep, when I see it, and I said, okay, you got an ineffective assistance of counsel case here. Like I did the uh, Russell Simmons from Def Jam. I did his son's case. Got him back okay. on a 2255. He had NLPA doing his stuff. They wrote the wrong name. They said he was in there for robbery. He wasn't. It was a drug case. I mean, they just destroyed this dude's 2255. So I had like seven or eight, and I wrote it from prison. I had like seven or eight days left to do it. And he's from New York. I'm from New York. So I jumped on it. I did it, man. He's back in court. Just had an evidentiary hearing. Hopefully we win that. But, um, but like you, you know, you got to pick and choose, man, because I don't like to lose. I don't want to lose. Oh, I hate to lose. I'm super competitive and I hate to lose. Me too. I, I can tell, dude, you're a high strung dude. Yeah, um, definitely. So tell me your home now. You're free. How old are you? If you don't mind. 34. Yeah, you're 34. 34. How's it feel to be free? Man, it's, uh, it's, it's, I'm going to tell you this, man. The first day I was free, I was stunned. I mean, I, I walked out of federal prison and I went uh, and, and, I, and, I, and I went and I went to this little restaurant, this little uh, seafood restaurant. And I'm sitting there and all the waitresses, they look like models to me. You know what I mean? These are like average girls, but they look like supermodels. And I'm sitting there and I'm like, I'm trying not to ogle them. But at the same time, I'm like, man, these women are beautiful. I'm single. I don't have any kids, you know. So, you know, I, and I've been locked up for nine and a half years and I'm just it felt crazy to take a menu. And to pick what I wanted and to order off that menu and have that choice, brother, that felt empowering. It felt good. And I'm going to tell you this, I'm sitting at this table, right? And I look over and there's a, there's a guy in, in black and he's got the, the, the he's got the, the, the flag on him. I'm thinking that's BOP right there. I swear he looked just like a, a he just looked just like a prison guard. I wasn't sure if he was BOP or if he was state or whatever, but it, it I'm like, man, you know what? Eight hours ago, man, you could have you could have busted my balls, but now there's nothing you can do. You know what I mean? There's yeah. nothing you can do now. So yeah, man, it's, it's empowering, brother. I actually um, have signed up for my CDL program, um, trying to get trying to get into that. I talked to the admissions department at Pearl River Community College. Um, I got several job interviews lined up with uh, Toyota and with uh, with a Chevrolet dealership here. Um, I got my phone, thank God. <laughs> Uh, I got my truck. My mom and dad bought my truck up here. Uh, yet, not yesterday, the day before yesterday. So it's been, it, it, it's, 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 it's really, it's really felt good, man. I had some, let me tell you something, man. I didn't have a lot of people in my circle. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But the ones that I did have, I promise you, brother, I would not be here today without them. And there's one person in particular, I'm not going to put her name out there because I don't want to embarrass her, but I'm going to tell you something. She rode the whole nine and a half years out with me. And I wouldn't be the man I am today without her because she believed in me before I even believed in myself. So, you know what I mean? I had a really good, uh, I had a, I had a really good support group, brother. That's what got me through it, you know? Let me tell you something, man. You're 34 years old. You can, you, you can go to law school, man. You can go to <laughs> law school. You can become a lawyer. You know who Sean Hopwood is? Yeah, yeah, a law dog. I actually just had his book. I, I'd seen it. I was like, I, I read it years ago and it kind of inspired me. And I was like, let me look at it again. Cause I, I didn't remember if he became a lawyer or not. And at the end of the book, he's in law school, but he wasn't admitted to the bar. So I wasn't sure. So let me tell you, if he was let me tell you a couple things about Sean, man. And other people might want to hear this. Sean went to prison, armed bank robber, gets out of prison, becomes a one of the best jailhouse lawyers, won three writ of certs in the Supreme court as a jailhouse lawyer, goes to law school, He's a law professor at Georgetown, owns his own law firm. The girl in the book, he ends up marrying her. She's a yep. lawyer now, and he also works closely with the White House. He he was a major, I, I believe that he was a major part of the first step back. Um, under He worked with the Trump administration. I mean, these are the things that you can do. Brandon Sample, same type of guy, went to prison. Probably the best post-conviction attorney out right now. Um, a lot of the, Christopher Zoukas, I write for Criminal Legal News and Prisoner's Legal News. Chris was, you know, one of the one of the writers over there with me. Chris is in law school, getting ready to, you know, get his law degree. You know, you could do that stuff, man. And you're young enough to do it. I'm a little older yeah. than you, so. And and I'd probably have an, uh, a 
uphill battle because of the government, man. They were just so vicious in my case. So they would right. probably try to stop me from, you know, getting admitted. So that's not right. the route that I took, but you're definitely at the age that you could do that, bro. You could do yeah. and I can tell, dude, you're an educated dude. I can tell I can tell talking to you. You're high strung, probably be a good trial attorney. Yeah. I appreciate it. You know, I spent the entire time and all I read was nonfiction. All I read was business, law, politics, history, um, finance, real estate. I didn't read anything that wasn't educational, you know, autobiographies like uh, Clarence Thomas's man. That was a, that was a great read. That was an awesome read to hear the, the, the struggles that he went through with alcoholism and then uh, the Anita Hill stuff. And I mean, it was, he, he had a crazy, and then the, the, the high tech lynching and all this. I mean, he was, he was an incredible guy, man. I really look up to, 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 to justice Thomas. So let me He's ask you this. Person. What, is there anything that you miss about prison? No. Nothing. Nothing. I'm glad you said that. I'm glad that you said that. Being free, you know, the message here is to save kids from life imprisonment and premature death in the streets. And what I mean by that, them not making the decisions that we made, right? Um, not getting Absolutely. killed out here on the street because they're selling $100 worth of crack in front of the corner store. Yeah. That's what I mean yeah. by premature death in the streets. So, um, What message would you give to kids? I mean, you made $1,200 for selling guns and ended up losing nine years of your life. So what message would you have for kids today or for your younger self? You know, you know, it's a tough question, right? Because a lot of the kids are going to look at me, you know, and, and they're, and they're not going to be able to connect with me, right? Because I'm older now. Okay. Um, I, I've, I've often thought of mentoring youth, right? And, 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 and I'll tell you how I thought about doing it. I thought about going in with the, with the, with the, with the, with the shirt all buttoned up and, and the tie on and sitting there and talking. And then when I realize I'm losing them, just take the shirt off and show them all my tats and show them the scars from the fights. Okay. And so, and then maybe that would connect with them a little bit more when they saw I'm all tatted up. I got the jailhouse tats. Um, but I'm going to tell you what, there's no amount of money, whether it had been 1200 or 12 million, there's no amount of money that would have been worth what I just went through. Okay. None. I've had guys ask me like, come on, man, hypothetically, like, you know, if, would you do another 10 years for, for $20 million? No, I wouldn't do a, another minute for any money in the world. Okay. So the most important thing for the kids to understand is that the, the, the people that recruit in the gangs are not stupid. Okay. They actually out the, 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 the gang outreach is targeted towards kids who will be easily influenced, right? People that don't have the, their mothers or their fathers or, 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 or whoever, they don't really have a good family structure, okay? The brotherhood that you join is, is all smoke and mirrors, okay? And I mean that with all the respect, okay? I'm sure there's a lot of former and current gang members watching, um, watching this, and I mean that with all due respect. I'm not trying to hate on your sets or anything. I'm just, I'm just letting you know that a lot of your homeboys – won't really be homeboys when the time comes. Okay. If you look at the numbers of how many federal uh, inmates, I mean, I'm sorry, federal defendants cooperate with the government, the, the numbers staggering. It's like two thirds. Okay. So everybody's not going to just hold their water on you, man. And, and another thing, when you go down and all the good time is over with, when you stop picking up the tabs, at the bars, when you stop paying for the drugs and all that, all the girls and all the homeboys, they're gone. They're gone. And you might have four or five people that ride your bed out with you. That's if you're lucky. Because I know a lot of people that don't got nobody riding their bed out with them. So, you know, yeah, stay in school. I mean, I know that sounds so cliche and everything, but it, it's the truth. I, I, I got into a gunfight, right? When I, was, I, when I came into ninth grade, I got into a shootout at Cinemark, the movie theater. I, I got into a shootout on Friday night. I, I went there because this guy rough handled a girlfriend of mine. So I was going to straighten him out. And I end up in a, I end up in a, in a, in a shootout with, with, with a, with a rival neighborhood. I didn't even go there for that. Okay. So when I went back to school on Monday, guess who I see the guys we shot it out with. So I actually had to literally walk to the principal's office and say, Hey, you know, I got to call my mommy and daddy. I'm feeling sick. And I called my homeboys down the street and said, Hey, those fools are here. I need you to come and get me. And they drove up there and walked me out of school. And I never was able to go back because of that. Okay. So, you know, it's, it, it's not the life, man. Uh, all the, you know, a lot of the kids are influenced by the music and, and, and the culture 
the culture is 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 to be tough and be hard and be a hustler and, and this and that. But the movies and the rap music and the lyrics, they don't really show you the other side of that, where you're sitting in a cell day after day after day after day, rotting away. You know, they, they don't talk about that part because that's not glorious. You can't watch none of the gang movies. You can't watch none of the gangbang movies or none, none of the gangster flicks. They don't ever show those guys sitting in prison for the rest of their lives. Hey, let me ask you this. How many, how many, how many OGs have you seen? I'm talking about guys that are bosses in the world that controlled whole neighborhoods, that controlled a, whole, a bunch of soldiers, had millions of dollars. How many times have you seen them get, get, get their balls busted by the hacks? How many times you seen them, the, the police come in their room and tell them, hey, get up, get up, do this. Or, or, or they can't get their medication or they can't get out. They can't get in to see a doctor. That's no way to live, man. I hear you, man. Hey, I, I appreciate you coming on the show, man. And you got a hell of a story. And, and like I said, I know your co-defendant. I wrote a clemency petition, you know, and I appreciate you. And I appreciate you coming on the show. Definitely educated. You got, you know, Thank a lot you, of man. opportunities for you, man. And. Thank you, man. It, it really has been a pleasure, and I'm always willing to talk anytime. Well, I appreciate you. I'm going to close the show, man, telling you okay, thank man. you, telling people, thank man. Thank you, brother. Hit that subscribe button, hit the like button, share the video. Blood on the Razor Wire TV with respect. Until tomorrow, we're out. <laughs>